a much better presentation in person, but uh, hopefully you guys can pick up some pearls and things from the lecture that will be uh, helpful for both boards and for your career, uh, whether you're going into glaucoma or not. Uh, pediatric glaucoma is a fun topic. It's a very small niche area, but uh, there's a lot of crossover with a lot of different specialties. Those of you that are going to be even doing plastics or neuro, you will encounter pediatric glaucoma in your career, uh, no matter what you do from comprehensive cornea uh, to neuro-ophthalmology. So uh, let's just start and feel free to stop and ask any questions. Um, and then we'll keep going, okay? Now, I can't see everybody. I know some of you are still probably getting up, but uh, maybe I'd, I'd like to have some participation. Otherwise, this is gonna be a pretty quick lecture. Uh, all of this is gonna be question format. And we'll just kind of talk about different things, uh, different features and uh, things that you might find interesting, some questions that may come up. Um, and then I'll show a video. Some of you have seen some uh, pediatric glaucoma surgery. And so I'll just show you kind of a classic case, kind of my go-to surgery for uh, most cases of congenital glaucoma. Okay, question one. Which of the following is not a classic feature of congenital glaucoma? Enlarged cornea, also known as pubthalmus, hobstria, myopia, conjunctival injection, epiphora, photophobia, and blepharospasm. So I'm just going to start picking on people that I see in, in our group. Um, let's start with uh, who's here. How about Cole? I think I see you're on Cole. This is just kind of an open discussion. Uh, what do you think about this list? What, what things are, are not classic features of congenital glaucoma? The classic triad would be the last three, pifra, photophobia, mm -hmm. blood spasm. Uh, you certainly can see Hobbes trie, pubdalmus, uh, and kind of progressive axial myopia. So I, I think conjunctival injection would be too broad. Yes, yes, I, you, that is correct. The answer is conjunctival injection. Uh, that, that triad is what you alluded to at the bottom, epiphora, photophobia, blepharospasm, and then um, enlarged cornea buphthalmos. Everything else is pretty much classic features for congenital glaucoma. Now, is there an age range when you, have you come up with some sort of scheme for uh, determining what is uh, congenital, how do you, how do you categorize these? How do you categorize pediatric glaucomas in other words? I guess thinking about age range, um, I know juveniles like four to 35, I think is the BCSC. So I kind of think of congenital, I guess is earlier than four, but usually within the first couple of months to year of life. Yeah, I think congenital glaucoma is, you know, at birth, and then there's infantile, which is in that range after birth um, or after a year. So, and then, yes, you're correct in terms of juvenile open angle glaucoma is a very broad, large range. Uh, essentially, in your BCS book, I think it says, what, 4 to 35. And just realize that anybody who presents with glaucoma at a young age um, is in that broad category of juvenile open angle glaucoma. Okay, let's see. So this is just a picture of Hobstria. Do you guys remember? Uh, let's let's Abigail. Do you remember Hobstria in terms of this is a path question that may come up. It's a crossover question between glaucoma, pediatrics, and pathology. Um, but do you remember these are Hobstria that you see here in this photograph? But what exactly at what level are Hobstria occurring? Is it at the level of Say it again, Abigail. Sorry, um, is this better? Um, I think it's at the level yeah. of the endothelium. Close. Or oh, decimase, sorry. Decimase, that's correct. So breaks and decimase is why hopstria occur. Uh, and then that's what leads to potentially corneal edema opacification. Okay. All right, very good. All right, question, next question. Which of the following age ranges 
portends a better prognosis for patients with primary congenital glaucoma? Uh, you know, this is a more detailed question, but this comes up all the time. In fact, this came up last night. Uh, we had a patient who presented with primary congenital glaucoma at birth. The several UAs prior to today or yesterday were reasonably controlled pressures on medical therapy. Uh, and now the kid was four months old. Um, and mom had a question about this, which of the following age ranges portends a better prognosis? So what, why don't we go with, this is kind of a, I think a senior level question. How about uh, Ariana? You're going into glaucoma. This is gonna come up a lot next year. And... Um, okay, I actually don't know the answer. I guess I would think uh, older age but I'm not sure. Yes, so this is the magic window that I want you guys to remember for primary congenital glaucoma. It's three to 12 months, okay? And the way I think about it is if someone presents at birth with congenital glaucoma and signs of congenital glaucoma, you know, that's pretty severe. This has been going on in utero and um, it's often a, a more difficult case, very challenging case. If they present older, um, that also could uh, present some issues as well. Uh, but in that three to 12 month window where they're in that, they're still, their eyes developing quite a bit there, even their um, plumbing maybe is still developing. That tends to be a, a ripe time for response to surgery. So if they present in that three to 12 month range, they usually do pretty well with uh, angle surgery. Okay, next question. Uh, this is just a picture of bupthalmus, uh, just to realize that uh, it can be unilateral or bilateral. This is a bilateral case of uh, cloudy corneas and bupthalmus. Okay, next question. Which of the following are not distinguishing features of axenfeld rieger Bilateral, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant inheritance, sporadic, around 75% association with glaucoma, posterior embryotoxin, maxillary hypoplasia, hypospadias, and pituitary abnormalities. Uh, so Mike, I think Mike, you're on, the, you're on with us, Mike Murray. What do you think about this list? Let's just kind of go down the list and see if you can recall some of the features, and then we can kind of by process of elimination, figure out the one which is not a distinguishing feature. Alrighty, um, so let's go through these. Um, looks like, um, so pituitary, I know, yes. Um, the hypospadias, I would say yes. Maxillary hypoplasia, I would say yes. Um, the posterior embryotoxin, I'd say yes. 75% association. I am not sure about that one. I think it might be a little lower, but I'm not sure. Um, sporadic, I would say no, because a lot of them are, uh, well, I think they can be sporadic, but a lot of them are autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant. Um, and then bilateral, I would say no. That it's not a feature? That That's it's not. Yes. Yeah. Most okay, of them are, good. I think, unilateral. So actually, most of them are bilateral. Oh, okay. And axenfeld rieger can be inherited um, in many, either autosomal recessive and or autosomal dominant, but actually most cases are autosomal dominant. And so that's just some, and I want you to think about this. If you guys have ever rotated on, on pediatric glaucoma service or pediatric service, we have groups of families who are coming in for axenfeld riegers and so that should let you know that this is a very strong gene and a very uh, strong inheritance pattern. And so um, most of the cases are autosomal dominant. When you see groups of families with uh, axenfeld riegers, you know you can kind of remember, oh yeah, for for Mendelian inheritance, most of these are autosomal dominant. But you can have some sporadic cases. The other theme that I want you to take away with, and this is kind of throughout glaucoma, uh, for many things in terms of risk for when they talk about things like pseudoxfoliation, um, pigmentary glaucoma, axenfeld riegers the general ballpark, if you have to guess for your test, is about 50%, <laughs> okay? So 
Uh, all of these are features. Bilateral is a feature, autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant. Most are autosomal dominant, some sporadic, but around 50% are associated with glaucoma. So the answer here is around 75% association with glaucoma is not a distinguishing feature. I know, tough question. I'm just picking some things out, some nuances, but uh, otherwise might be picked them out really well, okay? Uh, okay, so here's a classic picture of a posterior embrotoxin. Um, this is a very dramatic case. Sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes you may not be able to see this until you actually do gonioscopy, intraoperative gonioscopy, like with a microscope um, and a gonio prism where you can actually see all these different features. And sometimes it's very subtle, just a little bit of curling around Schwabe's line. Um, so you may not see this kind of dramatic case. It's just, you know, very, very overt. Um, why is that important? Uh, let, I'll go back to you, Catherine. This is a great cornea question. Um, posterior embryotoxin. Why, why is this pathology? What, what's the pathology of a posterior embryotoxin? And why, what types of features may you see in a posterior uh, or in an accidental regurgitation patient uh, that, that is related to the posterior embryotoxin? Ooh, um, it's mostly, I know it's based in just anterior segment dysgenesis. That's the basis of it. So um, ooh, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> what are some other features other than, what are you, what are you Remember that this is a common entity that we confuse with ICE syndrome, mm -hmm. but what's the dead giveaway in demographics between Axenfeld versus ICE? ICE syndrome is in a female and it's unilateral. Okay, but what about age demographics? And I'll give you a clue. We're talking about pediatric glaucomas. This is in adults. Yeah, young adults. You guys remember vanilla ice? That's kind of the, the picture you should have in your mind of young adults who, who present with ice syndrome. Uh, but Axenfeld Riegers is a is a is a um, pediatric glaucoma. Okay, mm -hmm. you're going to pick these up early on, and there's a the, a whole spectrum of anterior segment dysgenesis that we kind of lump in here with Axenfeld Riegers uh, because of incomplete penetrance. So what types of things are, can you see though, in terms of the physical exam? Let's say you don't see a posterior veritoxin. What are some other classic features that you can see on, on an axonfold patient? Anybody can chime in. Coroctopia. Okay. And how, that might, how, how might that be related to this posterior veritoxin? Oh, I'm not sure how it's related to the embryo toxin, I thought it was just in general for Exenfeld Riger. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in? I mean, iris atrophy, polychoria. Yeah, so th this is, this is a, uh, an abnormal membrane that can start to pull on the iris and the angle structures. So hence you see corectopia and hence you see uh, peripheral anterior synechia, okay? So uh, the idea is, is that this abnormal membrane that you see, the posterior embryotoxin, has contractile features on it, okay? Similar to an ice membrane that can cause contractile features and, and pull on the iris and where you can get corectopia as well, okay? Okay, next question. Which of the following are not distinguishing features of a Peters anomaly. Uh, Catherine, I'll go back to you here. After, I'll read the list and then you can just kind of work through this list. Leucoma, corneal lenticular adhesions, irritocorneal adhesions, sporadic inheritance, unilateral, and around 50% glaucoma risk. So which of the following are not features of a Peters anomaly? Let's see, not distinguishing features. Yeah, so which ones are first? We can do process of elimination here. Yeah, um, is leucoma, is that corneal whitening? Yeah. Okay, so yes, that is a feature. Um, corneal lenticular adhesions, I'm not quite sure about that one. Um, Irritocorneal adhesions, 
not quite sure about that one. I think yes. And I think it is sporadic and inherent and, and unilateral. And I'm actually not quite sure about glaucoma risk. Okay, sounds good. All right. So yes, glaucoma is the white uh, lesion that you see of the cornea. And if you remember a Peter's anomaly, um, the dead giveaway is that you get this, you know, big white spot right in the center of the cornea. Uh, you're thinking is this trauma, but you know, usually these cases are bilateral. Okay. So the answer here is actually unilateral. It is not, a, a, it's not unilateral Peters. Most of the time it's bilateral peers. Gotcha. Um, and that's, and that's kind of the dead giveaway. And if you remember that the leucoma is really a Pandora's box. If you were to lift off the leucoma, there's a lot of badness typically underneath that leucoma. And that's where you get into the lenticular adhesions or the iridocorneal adhesions. And so sometimes it'll just be these sprouts, these um, roots that come off the iris that go right to the leucoma. And they can be very difficult to deal with um, during surgery, um, especially for cataract surgery, where you have to kind of lice all these adhesions off. And obviously your view is terrible when you have a giant uh, Peter's anomaly too. So some of these patients may have to undergo corneal transplant, but it is kind of the Pandora's box on the, on the top of the cornea. So this is a typical feature. Well, it doesn't look too bad, right? But if you were to do UBM here or OCT, uh, you would see that underneath this are strands of iris tissue coming up to this leucoma. So it's not simply something that you can just uh, scrape away or do a limit, limited PKP in that region. There's usually going to be adhesions underneath. And if you remove them, there's gonna likely be some anterior segment uh, disorganization. And uh, so you might need some anterior segment reconstruction after this, okay? And once again, 50% glaucoma risk. So if you have to guess on your test about the risk for glaucoma, guess 50% for most of your questions. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Next one. All right. A parent with a one-year-old aneritic child um, is wondering about the long-term risk of glaucoma. Which statements are not true about aneridia and glaucoma? So why don't we go with... Um, Who's been on pediatric glaucoma service? I, I only want to, I'll pick on those that, those of you that wrote, have actually rotated on service so far. Sean, have you done pediatric glaucoma service yet? I mean, I've been on pediatric, so I guess, uh, and, and some, there's, maybe saw a little bit of glaucoma, but I'm not sure that's going to help me with this question. <laughs> that's um, okay. But, um, so, so which things are not true about aniridia and glaucoma? I mean, you know, you've got that 50% number there. Uh, I, I would, I would imagine that it's higher. I, I think it's higher than that. Uh, the risk of glaucoma and aniridia. Um, I think the second one, well, let's go with, yeah. So there could I be multiple the answers here. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think. I'm, I'm really not sure, but I think that the mechanism is, is this genesis of the angle um, rather than synechial closure. And um, I think that glaucoma probably could develop after birth. Um, although that would probably implicate something more like synechial closure. Uh, but I, I I really actually don't know. Okay, that's so okay. I think it's, I think the risk is higher than fifty percent. Yes, you are correct that it's well, you're around fifty to seventy percent uh, risk for glaucoma in patients with aniridia. Now, there's a theme here in pediatric glaucoma that I want you guys to remember in terms of when children present with glaucoma. If they're fairly young, okay, it's usually dysgenesis of the angle. Okay. Now, in an aneritic patients are interesting because um, they can develop glaucoma over time. Um, and in the second decade, sometimes they, that may be their chance when they develop glaucoma. It doesn't always have to present at a young age. Um, but I think what's important is here is gonioscopy and figuring out exactly what's going on. As you remember, in aneritic patients, there's sometimes often some residual stump. It's not like they're completely aneritic. 
And so by doing gonioscopy, uh, that actually helps to determine what your surgical approach is. So if I have a patient who presents at a very young age with aniridia, uh, one year or less, then I'm gonna do a gonioscopy and I'm gonna check. And most of the time when I've examined these patients, there is no anterior synechia. And so I'm gonna give it a chance. We're gonna perform angle surgery. Uh, these cases are a little bit tough because um, you've got no protection and you've gotta be very careful that you don't nick the lens and cause a cataract. Uh, but it is possible to do uh, angle surgery in these patients and they often do pretty well. But over time, if the patients progress and you start to see peripheral anterior synechia and that stump starts to rotate and really close off the angle, uh, then you're going to be moving into a different type of procedure like a bypass, either a trabeculectomy, a zen, or a tube trend surgery. Okay. So the mechanism uh, can be either of, the, uh, of those two. That's Early correct. in life, it's dysgenesis, but if it occurs later, it's more sneakyl, like more likely. That's right. Yeah. And so, and that's true of all glaucomas. Like you can pretty much, if someone comes in with an early type of glaucoma, it's, you know, it's usually angle dysgenesis. But once you, you know, for primary, for primary glaucoma, if you've already ruled out other causes such as trauma, et cetera, uh, steroids, uh, these, these cases are going to be dysgenesis of the angle. So we're going to give it a, a try. We're going to do angle surgery in these patients. Okay. All right. Next question. All right, um, an infant with Sturge Weber syndrome presents with congenital glaucoma. Which of the following is not correct? Uh, why don't we go with, Abigail, you're going into plastics. You'll probably be seeing a lot of these cases. Can you hear me okay? Um, yes. My audio is weird, sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So infant um, with Sturge Weber presenting with congenital glaucoma. Which of the following is not correct? Uh, I think iridotrabecular dysgenesis is the likely mechanism is not correct. You feel that that one is not correct? I think so. So I'll give you a clue. In the last question, we, we just talked about these themes that you'll see in pediatric glaucoma. If kids present early on, it's usually due to iridotrabecular dysgenesis or angle dysgenesis. Right. Okay, and this is an infant, so that would like, be the mechanism. Um, so the, yeah, so the clue here, I'm, 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 this is an infant. Oh, is it the lower eyelid? I can't remember, sorry. So you're, now we're talking about just um, the lesion in a Sturge Weber syndrome patient, right? And the port wine stain is actually in the upper eyelid. It's more likely if it involves the upper eyelid. That showed up on my board's question and I couldn't believe it, but ever since then, I've remembered that it's the upper eyelid uh, if is more likely to portend uh, glaucoma if the port wine stain is on the upper eyelid. I don't know why, um, it's just some, one of those things that you kind of tuck away a little pearl. Okay, is anything else not correct here? An infant with stirred web? The tube shunt. Tube shunt is preferred over angle surgery. So this is a tricky question, but what I'm trying to tease out here for you guys is to understand that is it the first if one? A, if it's if it's yes. congenital glaucoma, because it, it would be higher EV, EVP would develop later. That's correct. Yes. So what I'm trying to get at here is another theme. There's a theme just kind of reiterating the same thing. If you have an infant that presents with glaucoma, angle dysgenesis is the most likely cause, right? Even though this patient has a port wine stain, you're thinking, oh yeah, ep ep elevated episcleral venous pressure. But in this case, because it's an infant, the things that are not true is that elevated EVP is the most likely mechanism of glaucoma. That's not true, that's true later in life, okay? And then the other part of this is that a tube shunt surgery is preferred over angle surgery. That is not the correct approach for this because it's an infant, because it's angular dysgenesis, we're gonna do angle surgery as our preferred approach, uh, even in a patient with a port wine stain and Sturge Weber syndrome. Okay, 
So I'm not really worried about the risk of a choroidal effusion and choroidal hemorrhage. Those are the things that we worry about in patients with elevated epistolar venous pressure, okay? Does that make sense, that question? Do you guys have questions about that? Yeah, I have a question about um, angle surgery. Mm -hmm. Is it that, that angle dysgenesis, is it that it's like we're targeting the trabecular meshwork and doing TM surgery or we're doing something else in the angle that addresses something other than the TM? No, that, I mean, at, at present, I hope one day I'll be able to intervene in collector channels. But as of right now, the only thing I can do is either strip or stent the trabecular meshwork. Um, so, I mean, we could, you can viscodilate, I guess, uh, but usually we're doing viscodilation in, in the setting of uh, doing a trabeculotomy, okay? And so when I refer to angle surgery for kids, uh, I'm referring to basically doing either a goniotomy or a trabeculotomy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have yet to put any stenting devices uh, in, in kids. Um, and I, I don't know if anybody has done that before. I think the most progressive thing that people have done is a co-hook dual blade where they basically just peel off the TM, right? Uh, but most of the time we're just doing a cutting procedure and doing an otomy of some sort, either goniotomy or trabeculotomy. Okay. All right. Next. Dr. Chaya, just to clarify, you yes. said a tube shunt is not preferred over angle surgery in this case. Yes, because it's an infant. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So yes. again, just that pearl, that, that clinical pearl that you guys are going to see throughout your life. Infants with glaucoma, angle dysgenesis, that should just come to mind. And we're going to try to do angle surgery. Right. Even though I threw in these confounding things that, oh, this is a patient with Sturge Weber. And you're thinking, oh, poor wine stain, epi mm -hmm. elevated episcleral venous pressure. That's something that you want to categorize for patients when they're older as a possible cause, right? Uh, so for example, I might have a patient that we follow in, or you guys might have a patient that you follow with Sturge Webb and a port wine stain and they don't have glaucoma as an infant or as a, as a child, but maybe later as a teenager, they present and um, how, would you how would you decide? What, should I do angle surgery or should I do tube stunt surgery? I would be cautious to do a tube stunt surgery in a teenager or in a young adult patient with Sturge Webber because of the risk of choroidal hemorrhage. When you rapidly decompress the eye, uh, you put them at risk of having a choroidal effusion and choroidal hemorrhage. So these are cases where we typically would put a tube in in a stage process, or we would ligate an almond valve uh, in order to kind of stage uh, the decompression. Mm -hmm. So if we were doing it, the way we used to do it is we'd put an almond valve in, just sew the plate in and not actually put the tube inside of the eye. Then we would wait for maybe six to eight weeks and to allow a capsule to develop over the plate. And then we'd come back for stage two and then put the tube actually into the anterior chamber or the sulcus. Hmm. And the idea being is that if you have a biological valve, the capsule, the, the tenons that forms over the shunt, uh, you're gonna reduce the risk for kind of rapid decompression, right? Gotcha, okay. Uh, so, cause if I just put a tube in immediately, it's gonna start working from day one. Mm -hmm. And if you drop them too fast in a patient with epi elevated episcleral venous pressure, there, there's a, a larger risk for choroidal fusion and hemorrhage. Okay. Okay, next question. All right, which of the following is true regarding aphakia after congenital cataract surgery? Which of the following is true regarding aphakia after congenital cataract surgery? Cataract surgery, 15 to 50% or more developed glaucoma. The patient is only at risk of developing glaucoma within the first, uh, sorry, let me remove my, within the first three years after surgery. Iridotrabecular dysgenesis is the most common cause. Removal of all residual cortex during surgery may reduce the risk. And small corneal diameters are a risk for developing glaucoma. And cataract surgery in the first year of life is a risk factor. Okay, who wants to take this on? A lot, a lot to cover here. And there are multiple answers. I can give it a shot. So 15 to 50 percent or more develop glaucoma. I think that's true. Um, the patient is only at risk of developing glaucoma within the first three years. That's not true. They're, I think they're at risk the rest of their life. Iridotrabecular dysgenesis is the mechanism. I think that 
the mechanism I think it's not like definitely known but that if the patient had a cataract and so um like anterior segment dysgenesis is considered possibility um because something led to their cataract in the first place and so their angle may not be normal either and then removal of all residual cortex reducing the risk i don't know a small corneal diameter as a risk um that seems true to me in like the anterior segment dysgenesis category, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And then cataract surgery in the first year of life is a risk factor. Yes, that's true. Earlier surgery is a risk. Okay, great. All right, so we'll start at the top. There's that 50% rule again, uh, shows up a lot in on your, on your questions. Uh, if you have to hedge, you can usually say around 50%. The patient is only at risk of developing glaucoma within the first years, three years after surgery that is false okay you can as um uh, Ari ariana said uh, this can be something that can develop you know within the first few months after surgery or could be developing later in life okay so irritotrabecular dysgenesis is not the most common cause and you really have to do a good exam to figure out exactly what the cause is but many of us in glaucoma understand that or, or we don't understand truly how the the, the, the exact mechanism but there is something that seems to be very important for the development of the angle uh, for a patient to, to retain their lens. When you remove that lens, uh, there's either a, you know, some postulated theories about stretching of the scleral spur um, and, and how that relates to the angle. So really we like to think of the lens angle as a complex, and there seems to be something that's uh, th that's really detrimental to the development of the angle if you remove the lens early on. As you know, the eye is growing, um, and so there's some there seems to be a role in terms of a, 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 a beneficial role for the lens to be retained in the development of the angle. So by removing it very early in life, you, you definitely put them at risk of developing uh, maldevelopment of the angle. But it's not really your classic example of an irritotrabecular dysgenesis uh, where there's maldevelopment early on. Now, you have to do good gonioscopy because if a patient presents with a history of cataract surgery as an infant, uh, you need to figure out what the mechanism is. Is it truly open angle? If it's truly open, then I would consider doing angle surgery to see if removing the trabecular mesh work um, may help to decompress the eye. However, these patients may develop synechia and you can get kind of a creeping, crawling peripheral anterior synechia. And so if I have an angle that's completely zipped up in a patient with a history of infantile cataract surgery, we're gonna be moving on to a different procedure. Uh, I won't even try to take these down. I think it's kind of a mess to try to take down uh, these types of synechia. Uh, if it's limited, you can, and then do some angle surgery, but usually we're moving on to a bypass surgery, okay? Uh, so, and then removing all the residual cortex. Why is that helpful? you guys know the kids are very pro-inflammatory. And so if there's a lot of post-operative inflammation that could cause a disruption or uh, to the angle and to the trilobacter mesh work and cause dysfunction. So it's important to be meticulous when you do pediatric cataract surgery. Uh, you really want to remove uh, all the cortex used by manual if you have to get out to the fornix and really search for cortex. Removing the lenticular material, the, the, the core nucleus and epinucleus is a piece of cake. You just slurp it out. And uh, really most of my time spent during infantile or pediatric cataract surgery is removing the residual cortex and polishing the lens epithelial cells, which I'm a big fan of, particularly for pediatric patients. Um, um, because th these kids, if you don't, they end up with huge cell rings, rings uh, that become problematic later either as adults or as either as a juvenile adolescent or adult patients and small corneal diameter uh, that makes sense you know mic microphthalmia mic microcornea uh, these patients have a, a tight angle just by sheer volume the, the anterior chamber volume is small uh, the iris is closer to the, uh, the trabecular mesh work and is at risk of developing uh, synechial closure okay okay next question which of the surgical approaches is the preferred method of treatment, okay, in a one-year-old with primary congenital glaucoma and cloudy corneas? 
Uh, this I'm going to give this question to the, anyone who's rotated. I think Cole, have you been on? I think you've been on the pediatric glaucoma service, right? And so sure. <laughs> hopefully now here's some clues as you read this question. It's a surgery question. It's a one year old with primary congenital glaucoma. So we already talked about angle dysgenesis as being the primary mechanism. And this patient also has cloudy corneas. Yeah, so we're certainly not gonna put in a tube uh, and to do a goniotomy, you need visualization of the angle. So you can't do that with the cloudy cornea. Um, and so I think then you, you need to do a trabeculotomy or ectomy and the trabeculotomy ab external, I think would probably be the first choice. Yes, that, that's, that's correct. So uh, these terms are confusing. Um, and I want you, if you're, if you're gonna remember this for a test, a goniotomy requires you to use a gonioprism and hence you would need to have a clear cornea. So you answered correctly that for a goniotomy, you need a clear cornea uh, to be able to visualize the angle. Now, sometimes you get lucky. Last night we got lucky. We had a patient with a cloudy cornea and the view was marginal. Um, and I had one small window. If I tilted the patient far enough away from me, I was able to look between the cloudy central cornea and the limbus, which had cleared uh, since birth. And so I had a very small window where, where I was able to do a, um, a goniotomy. Um, now, you guys have heard of the GAT technique. The GAT technique is gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. And so this is confusing because for this type of procedure, for the GAT procedure, you do need to have a good clear cornea, relatively clear, because you are using a goniotomy prism uh, or gonioprism. Now, in the classic sense, when for this question, a trabeculotomy before we had angle surgery techniques and before we had catheters and sutures and things that we could use to cannulate Schlem's canal, uh, we were able to do a trabeculotomy ab externo. And that's where we do a cut down, we do a peritomy, we make a flap or a slit, and then we basically dissect our way from external to internal into Schlem's canal. Um, it's probably the, one of the most challenging, but one of the most fulfilling procedures to be able to do, um, because once you get down to that anatomy, um, you really have to, there's, there's clues to know that you're in the right space and that you're unroofing Schlem's canal. And one of them is the scleral spur is a very, the scleral fibers uh, that represent the scleral spur become parallel right at the limbus. So if you're wondering, am I there yet? Am I there yet? what you're doing is you're looking for the fibers. If you see your very irregular fibers going in every different direction, you're not at the spur yet. The fibers become very organized and parallel to the limbus once you reach the spur. So once you've identified the spur, you just keep unroofing a little bit more and getting through those corneal layers until you're literally right just above Schlem's canal. And you have to use a utrata forcep or a non-tooth forcep, not, something that's not too sharp and just basically peel off the layers as you unroof Schlem's canal, and then you just start to see uh, aqueous fluid percolate into the canal uh, or into that space. And from there, you thread the, canal, uh, thread the catheter or suture, and you may be able to achieve 360 degree treatment uh, by doing an otomy. Or we have something that we rarely use. We have these in our toolbox. We were almost ready to use it last night, uh, but it looks like a pitchfork. And this pitchfork is called the Harms trabeculotome. And the pitchfork works by you, you put one part of the probe and then you essentially just tear through the trabecular meshwork. And you can do that for 90 degrees or 180 degrees. We have probes that go to the left and probes that go to the right, uh, but that's an approach that where we would do it as an ab external technique, a trabeculotomy ab external. Trabeculectomy is actually um, the right procedure if you're in other parts of the world. You know, when I've traveled around and I've seen how people have managed pediatric glaucoma, they've done a trab trab. And what a trab trab is, is you do a trabeculectomy along with a trabeculotomy. So they'll dissect a trab flap and then they'll do a trabeculotomy with a harms trabeculotome. And then they'll make a punch and then convert that into a trabeculectomy. And so it, uh, but these are tough. Why, why do we not do, at least why do I not do trabeculectomies for kids? You can imagine if we're going to manage a trap in a child and we're going to have to cut stitches or 
uh, do suture lysis, that's pretty much impossible in, in a young child uh, because of cooperation. And that would require you to take them back for an exam under anesthesia every time you wanted to adjust the flap. Uh, now, there are ways to be able to do it where you leave the sutures a little bit loose, uh, but then I think you also risk um, hypotony, et cetera. And so I'm not a huge fan of doing trabeculectomy in kids unless you absolutely have no other choice. Um, we are doing Zens though. On this list is, it, not on this list is the Zen, which is a small gelatin stent that we use to bypass and to create a blood forming procedure. I think that's a reasonable approach for congenital glaucoma and for kids because you don't have stitches to, to manage postoperatively. So the answer to this question is, the first choice would be a trabeculotomy, ab external, or the cornea is too cloudy. We can't use a gonio prism. That's why goniotomy is not the correct answer. And trabeculectomy is the right answer if you're other parts of the world. But I think for your board exams, the answer that you would end, uh, put here is trabeculotomy. Okay. Dr. Chai, quick question. Yeah. Um, if you uh, were trying to buy a kid time, would you ever do an ab interno uh, zen? Or would it just scar off so badly with all the tenons there? Does anyone do that? Just to buy time and say, oh, this might scar off, but we want to get the pressure down so that our trap will work better in the future. So you, because you're saying that if I do it ab externo and do a pretty that I'm just potentially causing more scar tissue and why not do it ab interno? Is that what you're saying? I'm just meaning if uh, often in adults, we say, oh, their pressure is high. And so the trap will be unpredictable in healing. And so sometimes we say, oh, we're going to do an angle surgery like a hydrus or whatever, just to bring down the pressure and make it a little more stable. And I think I'm not like super up on the data, but I think even when you put in like a hydrus in an adult in which they're going to get a trab, they do better if they've had some sort of megs. So I was wondering if you ever do that with a Zen in kids to like prep them for their future trab. Um, that's a good question. I, would, I will tell you that my, my general approach is to start on the angle for patients with congenital glaucoma. If that fails, we move on to a bypass. My first choice as a present would be a Zen. And I would do that as an ab external technique. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the ab internal technique for the Zen. That's how we were all trained how to do it. Uh, but particularly for kids who have very thick tenons, um, I think it's ripe for failure. And unless you can get that Zen in perfectly in the subconjunctival space, well, let me, my, I'll tell you my bias. I don't think the Zen in the subconjunctival space is a very safe place to put a stent. And I've seen uh, several cases of uh, Zen erosion, conjunctival erosion, when they're placed simply under the conjunctiva, uh, which is how we were taught to place them if you're not opening the conj. I, I prefer to do an ab external technique. We'll, we'll bring back the conjunctiva, we'll pull back the tenons, and then we know exactly that that Zen is gonna be placed under the tenons tissue. Now, can that patient get a trab later? Absolutely. If you're, if you're careful with your dissection, you're not too aggressive, there's still mobile tissue where you can put a trabeculectomy in later in life. Now, my new approach for patients who, let's say, fail a Zen surgery, and now I'm forced with the, uh, the decision to, to put a tube shunt in this patient, I like the approach that Sharon Friedman has espoused. Sharon Friedman, some of you know her, she's a pediatric glaucoma specialist, uh, uh, trained both in pediatric ophthalmology and glaucoma who runs the Duke uh, Pediatric Glaucoma Service. And she's a huge fan of, if you have to put a tube, tube shunt surgery in, or a tube in a patient with congenital glaucoma, or even a pediatric patient, a juvenile patient, is to put the tube down inferiorly in the inferior nasal quadrant. So you can save some superior conjunctival for a future filtration surgery, okay? So I don't know if that answers that your sense. question, Mike. No, that makes but, sense. Yeah. 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 So I'm always thinking about the next, the next plan, uh, the contingency plan. In fact, when I see parents, uh, when I counsel them for congenital glaucoma, I often tell them this is not going to be their first rodeo. This is going to be the first of many interventions over their lifetime to be able to control the disease. Right. Now, in the future, I hope that we'll have Preserflow. Preserflow is a, a, a new device that has not, unfortunately, about three weeks ago, the FDA ruled that they are not going to approve it here in the United States. 
Um, it's a long, complicated story. I won't get into it, but we're all disappointed. So presently, it's only available in Canada and Europe and parts of Latin America. Um, but I think that material has an advantage over the Zen material. The Zen, as you know, is a gelatin-based stent. Uh, it tends to degrade over time. I've seen it in some adults just completely melt away, almost disintegrate. Uh, but the Preserflow is a special type of uh, polymer uh, made out of a, a polymer called SIBS, uh, which is induces less tissue reactivity. And our hope is that we can uh, make this available one day for patients in the United States uh, with all types of glaucoma, but I'm particularly excited for patients with congenital glaucoma, okay? Are they right, putting it in kids yeah. internationally? Yes, yes. Um, Ike Ahmed has done probably, he hasn't done a thousand kids, but he's done a lot of kids with uh, glaucoma juvenile open angle and primary congenital glaucoma, and they've used it successfully uh, there in Canada. He has about, in his cohort, he has over a thousand patients, but that's all comers, that's adults, children, but uh, he's had some great results with um, pediatric glaucoma and the pressure flow. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, but let's see if we can have an answer because the parents are gonna wonder. The parents of a six month old child with PCG, primary congenital glaucoma, want to know how successful angle surgery will be for their child? What's the appropriate response? 50%. 70, <laughs> 70 to 80, 50%, better than 95%. Wow, that sounds like almost like cataract surgery uh, or 25%. So who wants to take a stab at this based on what we talked about? Remember we talked about that magic window, right? Is this patient in the magic window? Yes. Yes, three to 12 months. 78%. That is correct. So pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic. When I see a patient who presents in that magic window, I am very bullish with the parents. And I will tell them that there's a very good chance that this first initial surgery is going to do really well. And hopefully we won't need a, a, another major surgery for a while. Okay. Okay. Next question. All right. Uh, which of the following class of medications should be avoided in infants with glaucoma? I'm going to give this one to Tony. Uh, beta blockers, CAIs, alpha adrenergics, PGAs, or myotics? So definitely right off the bat, alpha adrenergics, we don't use them. Uh, for beta blockers, we do want to be careful if they have bronchospasm or if they're very small. Uh, for CAIs, I think you can use them, but just to be careful to check their electrolytes and make sure they're not having like lethargy. Uh, for PGAs, I think you can, but they're not very effective. And myotics, usually mostly just used for, I think it was um, like aniridia. Okay, so, so you're correct about alpha adrenergics. That is one class that we're, are we, so the clue in here though is infants, okay? We're talking about really young kids here. And why is it that we are avoiding alpha adrenergics? So they can cause uh, CNS depression and apnea. Yes, that is correct. So, you know, ophthalmologists, we can kill patients too. And this is one where you could kill the patient. <laughs> so uh, alpha adrenergics, that's definitely on your board's question. It will likely maybe even show up on your orals. Those of you guys that are gonna be taking your orals soon. I don't think mainly this is for our fellows. They've got orals coming up this weekend. Um, but sh should we avoid alpha adrenergics for all pediatric patients? Let's say I have an eight-year-old. We, we put them on COSOPT and a PGA. And uh, is it okay to use an alpha adrenergic for a patient who's older? Yeah, I think by eight would be okay. That was kind of where I was thinking of cutting, having a threshold. Yeah, and so I think the youngest that I've used it in is probably a six-year-old, but I was very careful to tell parents, um, you need to watch the patient when you first start this medication. And if they're very somnolent, we're gonna have to stop it, okay? And so it's appropriate to use in older kids, uh, but definitely avoid in your infants because of CNS depression. Myotics, uh, how, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with myotics. These are becoming a dying class of medications, but. Uh, can be very powerful for patients. Uh, the one that I'm thinking of that is commercially available, actually, this is a, um, a medication that was recently 
sold by Pfizer. Pfizer is the, was the main producer of phospholine iodide, okay, colonist race inhibitor. And um, by doing so, you allow the pupil to constrict and you really put some tension on the spur, okay? Uh, and myotics tend to be the magic drug for patients with aphakic associated glaucoma, okay? We don't really use them for most patients. I mean, I, we, we use them in practice. If a patient has angle surgery, I will definitely put them on a myotic agent for a few weeks, but usually I'm not putting them on a myotic agent for, for long-term administration. The one caveat is patients with aphakic glaucoma. It is a magic drug. I mean, you, you can try the PHAs and everything and you might get marginal improvement and you put a patient on phosphine iodide with aphakic glaucoma and it can be just remarkable the amount of, of, of pressure lowering that you get. And again, this has to do with the role of you know, by putting stretch um, on the scleral spur, uh, you may be able to open up the trabecular mesh work and improve the outflow. So as I think about aphakic glaucoma and the role of the lens and the development and the angle, there, by removing the lens, I think you actually uh, reduce the contraction uh, on the spur. Uh, give me just one second, let me turn off this alarm. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, some of you may know my grandmother lives with me now, and that's a, <laughs> a bed monitor. Every time she gets up, I got to go make sure that she's not going to fall. So uh, apologize for that delay. Um, next question. You have decided to use a beta blocker in an eight-month-old with PCG, uh, PCG patient status post-goniotomy. Which of the following are important considerations? Uh, beta blockers are contraindicated in kids less than one year old. Punctal occlusion can be helpful. 0.25% timolol or a beta blocker is the preferred concentration and should be avoided in patients with asthma or significant cardiac disease. Anybody want to take this one? I can take this one. Right. Um, okay. So should be avoiding patients with asthma or significant cardiac disease? Definitely. 0.25% um, is the preferred concentration. So I think 0.5 is the adult. So sure, let's go with it. Punctual occlusion can be helpful always to prevent systemic absorption. Beta blockers are contraindicated kids less than one. I believe that is not true. Uh, so that is correct. And many of you that have been on the pediatric glaucoma service, we love COSOP. That's actually 0.5% concentration. If you have a choice, uh, it would be ideal to start with a lower concentration in, in kids just because of the risk for um, bronchospasm and stuff but it's not an absolute thing. I mean, we use 0.5% even in infants. <laughs> so you just have to be careful, uh, but we do encourage pa uh, family members to do punctal occlusion for their children after they administer drops. Okay, so for, for this one, punctal occlusion and should be avoided in patients with asthma or significant cardiac disease are the answers for this question. Okay, okay. All right, which of the following is not true regarding juvenile open angle glaucoma? Presents between ages of four to 35, autosomal dominant, most common inheritance pattern. The angle can appear dysgenic like in PCG and progressive myopia can continue to develop until 10 years of age. And buphthalmus and hopstria are common. Um, I can take this one. I think that the angle is not dysgenic, like in primary, in, in congenital glaucoma, and then bubathalmos and hobstria would be more common in congenital glaucoma. So I feel like those are two are not true. Um, and I'm not sure about inheritance or progressive myopia, but I don't think that it's, actually, I do think it's autosomal dominant. 
Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So you are, you answered correctly. The ones that are not true for this question, the angle can appear dysgenic like in PCG. No, that's not true. The, the, the angle in a juvenile open angle glaucoma looks like a normal angle with your normal right. features, your normal landmarks, a little bit of pigmentation. Uh, but when you look at a patient, if you've ever seen a, a case with a, a primary congenital glaucoma, it, it would be described as featureless. There are, you can barely see any TM if, and, um, there's no spur. Uh, it just looks like iris and then it kind of just blends into cornea and you might see Schwabe's line, but that's it. You really don't see any uh, obvious features of the trabecular meshwork or the spur, okay? Um, we talked about hopstria, or I'm sorry, uh, bupthalmus. This is, an, this is a, a very important question or just a, an important clinical pearl. You guys remember when uh, bupthalmus stops it's like by three years exactly yeah around three to four years old so if you have a patient that's older than that you're that's not going to be a dead giveaway clue for you but myopia can be so um but realize that bupthalmus is something that we typically only see um, um in that setting we're only going to see in younger kids Bupthalmus is really that corneal stretching that really occurs only early on. And then after age of four or so, there's really no longer um, uh, any stretching of the cornea. Okay. All right. Next question. We're just about done. The role of CCT is well established in pediatric glaucoma and should be routinely measured in all children with glaucoma. True or false? False. That's correct. We don't do pachymetry uh, all the time for kids because there's no established norms. Um, is it helpful? It might be. You know, we have a patient who's now a teenager in our practice who has pressures of around mid twenties on max drops with with Dymox. Nerves look okay. We took her for an EUA. Um, she has um, uh, Axenfelds. I believe she has Axenfelds. And her corneal thickness is like 700. Uh, and so, you know, maybe that's why her pressures are a little bit on the higher side. The reason we're concerned for this patient is that she's had a previous history of having much lower pressure. So there's been a very dynamic change. Uh, you know, one of the things, one of the things about glaucoma is it's really change over time. Um, and so um, realizing that a patient who has thick corneas, if you're measuring the pressure consistently over time, if they have suddenly a dynamic change, you have to take that seriously. Just because they have a, a cornea thickness of 700 and their pressure is 25, that's, that may be a cause for panic. It really depends on historically where they've been. If their pressure has always been 25, then maybe that's totally normal for them. Uh, but if they at one time were well controlled and now pressures are getting out of control, I don't really look at that corneal thickness as a thing that's going to sway me and, and to dissuade me and to say, oh, you know, corneal thickness is, is elevated. A patient's going to do fine. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. This is the last question, I believe. The normal corneal, corneal diameter of a full term newborn is which of the following? Nine, 10, 11, or 12? And why is this important? Because you guys are going to be called to figure out, hey, is this bupthalmus or not? What's abnormal? Anybody want to? I'd say 10. 10. I was going to say nine. Nine. I'm going to vote for nine. Two for 10. Anybody else? I don't know, but this was an OCAPS question like directly from this year and I probably got it wrong, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was on OCAPS this year? Yeah, it was on OCAPS. This is like, was on OCAPS this year. Okay, well, here you go. Here's, here's, here's a free bonus point for next year. It's 10. Dang it. <laughs> yes, so 10 millimeters for a normal corneal diameter for full term newborn, okay? Just tuck that away because it might show up on OCAPS, maybe not next year, but seems like they alternate years and they cycle around. This was definitely on my OCAP, so, okay. All right. Uh, let's see, 
these are just some things to tuck away. I save this for last because I really despise genetics and having to remember all these little things, but these might be important. And I'll try to tease out some threads here that might be important. What are the two main genes associated with PCG? Anybody know? CIF is one of them, CYP. Yep, there you go. There's the CYP1 or cytochrome P450, family ones, subfamily B, blah, blah, blah. But if you if you have to guess, if, you, if they give you this uh, GLC3A locus, just remember that um, GLC has to do with all these glaucoma loci and just guess GLC something, 3A, 3B, whatever. <laughs> uh, the next one that's associated with it is the LTB2 um, gene. And I can't even remember what it stands for, but I think it's some sort of, some sort of transport gene. Um, or it's a transforming growth factor gene, I believe, okay? And so that has to do with development again, uh, that transforming growth factor is important for development of, 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 of collagen and different structures. And so that's why how I kind of tie it in with this association with primary congenital, primary congenital glaucoma and dysgenesis of the angle. Okay, which gene is associated with JOAG? Anybody wanna take a stab? Anybody remember? Tiger myoc. There you go. Okay, Tiger Myo C uh, is the one to remember. Okay, which gene is associated with aniridia? This is definitely on your boards at some point. I got it at least once or it, maybe even twice during my OCAPS. Act six. That's correct. All right. Which gene is associated with Axenfeld Rieger? Pax three. <laughs> that was Pax that. three. Pax three. Pax two. You're close. Pax five. Oh no. No. Pitix two. Okay. Or Foxy one. I like that one. Sounds kind of cool. So those are the two that you need to remember for uh, Axenfeld Riegers is Pitex two or Foxy one. Okay. Now, there is a large spectrum of some crossover. And so we get this kind of wastebasket of, of uh, associated genes and anterior segment dysgenesis. So why don't we just um, do a little drawing here? So which one is for PIDX2? Uh, axon Axonfelds. And which well, which other one? Foxy one. Foxy one. Okay. How about for Peter's anomaly? Also pack six. It's actually, I believe, all three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then pack six. In a radio. Okay, and then now PCG. Sip one B one. That's right. Okay, so the one you know, if you have to remember one to remember, you know, I would say the Pac six and Aniridia. That's shown up multiple times for me over my career. Let's see. Is that Pac six dominant? Okay. What's that? Is that PAX6 dominant for aniridia? Oh, you mean in terms of versus sporadic? No, no, versus recessive. Oh, uh, good question. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, my final public health announcement to all of you, big eyes are not cute, okay? Um, I think Disney has done a disservice to humanity and in most of their characters having really big, beautiful eyes, but big eyes are not cute for pediatric glaucoma. So uh, that is all I have for today. Do you guys have any questions though? Just in general about pediatric glaucoma, remember some takeaway themes, kind of that 50% risk is a big deal. Uh, remember the magic window for primary congenital glaucoma. 
three to 12 months, and those patients do well with angle surgery. Uh, pediatric glaucoma surgery rarely shows up on boards. It showed up once for me, and it had to do with that issue about what the best surgical procedure was. Um, and you had to know the difference between a goniotomy versus a trabeculotomy. Remember that a goniotomy requires a gonio prism, hence you need a good clear corneal view. Okay. Um, oh, medications. No. Oh yeah, medications. I was just going to ask in somebody with anterior segment dysgenesis or I guess mm -hmm. more corneal pathology in that sense, do you ever yes, avoid yeah. like CAIs? Because I know that we use a lot of COSOPT in kids, but does yes, that, yeah. has that ever like led to more endothelial dysfunction that you've seen or cloudiness? Um, I have not experienced that. This is, I think, something that I see more in adults who have mm -hmm. corneal decompensation yeah. with chronic CAIs, but I have yet to see it. Okay. Um, and I think our options are more limited with kids in terms of what we want to, I, I, oh, there are some things that we have used, some newer medications such as uh, Visolta mm -hmm. that might be helpful. And we are using some rock inhibitors now for, 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 for kids too. So uh, some new classes of medications that we've had experience with adults, we've been able to use them in, in, in kids as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, but in general, I don't avoid CAIs gotcha. in kids, unless I guess I were to see some sort of you know significant corneal deep compensation. Yeah, I was just wondering out of curiosity because I haven't seen that either, but just wondering if um, in your experience, cool, thanks. Yeah, I know I know our cornea colleagues frown when we're putting CAIs on their <laughs> on their transplant patients, but you know you got to do what you got to do. You got to save the save the nerve. I mean, we yeah. can always replace the cornea again. We can't do replace the nerve yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, I hope you guys have a great Memorial Day weekend. Um, sh short lecture today, but please reach out. I look forward to having those of you guys that have not rotated on service yet um, so that you can see some of these surgeries. And we have some great pathology here at, at, at the Moran in terms of big groups of families of Axenfelds and Sturge. And it's fun to be able to kind of tie these things in together. And to really educate your primary care colleagues to let them know, you know, to be able to screen for patients with uh, congenital glaucoma and refer them early. Kids do better if they're referred early, you know, rather than uh, what you see oftentimes in lower middle income countries where the cornea is completely scarred over already and uh, very tough recalcitrant cases. Mm -hmm.